Hey guys, welcome to your lecture on thinking. Cognition is going to be the term that we talk about when we talk about mental activities associated with processing, understanding, communicating information. In other words, memory, language, problem solving. Metacognition is how we self-reflect on any of those kind of activities, especially problem solving or thinking. So being metacognitive or having this kind of self-reflection period is a really good way for us to get better at thinking and thinking about thinking. Cognitive psychology really comes into its being in the 1950s. It is important that you guys have a general timeline that you understand of the emergence of the different disciplines in psychology. Starting back in 1879, with Wilhelm Wundt and the structuralist movement, moving into functionalism, then into Freud with the psychoanalytical or psychodynamic perspective, then into the behaviorist with Watson and Pavlov and Skinner, and now we're into the cognitive psychology realm. And during the 1950s, cognitive psychology and biological psychology, both of those start to have their emergence. We start looking at mental activities. We start looking at not just the environment and these unconscious motives that you would have gotten from the earlier disciplines, but also how we think and how we process information. The first thing that we are going to address is this idea of a concept. A concept is a mental grouping of similar objects, events, people. So why is an address a good example of a concept? Well, when you say the word address, several things have to kind of come together to make that one term make sense. It has to be the country that you're living in, the city, the street, the house number, and the zip codes. All of those things we simplify into a really simple concept called an address. On this slide, you're provided with the task of organizing all of these photos into a hierarchy based on concepts. We'll call this a conceptual hierarchy. The unifying concept for all of these pictures is obviously the color red. That we would call a superordinate concept. And the way that I always remember superordinate is think of Superman. He's going to be in the sky and he can oversee everything. Next, you're going to have more specific categories. The inclusivity of those categories becomes a little bit less. And so you might sit there and go holiday themes and maybe foods or uh, things you can wear, um, cartoon drawings, and again, maybe foods. I don't know which one you might want to go with, living and not living. But either way, you find that those categories become a bit more basic. They're still going to include a lot of different items below them, but still a bit more specific. If we decided to go with a basic category of living versus non-living, then we would go into our subordinate categories and we'd get even more specific. So in my non-living category, I might go with items of clothing and cartoon drawings. If I went into my living, I might go uh, vegetables, fruits, animals. And again, you see that those next set of concepts become almost more exclusive. It's harder to kind of fit their categories. With concepts, we have what we call artificial and natural concepts. An artificial concept is something that can be defined by a set of characteristics that all of the members must have, but no non-members can have. And the best example of this is the idea of a square. To be a square, you have to have four equal sides and four right angles. There's no other qualifiers that absolutely has to be met to be a square. There's always that thing in math where people will tell you all squares are rectangles, but no rectangles are squares. It's that kind of concept. However, we tend to have an easier time with natural concepts. Mammals and fish and birds, those concepts are easy for us to get and we're prepared to take them on. Natural concepts tend to be very basic and also they tend to be prototypical. Now, when I use the term prototype or prototypical, I mean the best example of a category or a concept. I don't mean your first attempt at creating something. So in this case, it's really important that you switch your brain to kind of psychology and go anytime we say the word prototype, we're talking about a best example of a concept. Schemas come back into this conversation because again, since we're talking about cognitions and schemas tend to be our organizations of how we understand knowledge. So concepts are grouped into our schemas. A basic unit of knowledge. It's usually going to be fed by our experience with the world and it's organized. If I throw out any kind of very general concept, 
you will find that you already seem to have kind of a, an understanding of how that one word tethers to all of these other ideas and whether it includes or it excludes other kind of concepts. So if I say the word dog, you might immediately go, all right, all of your school knowledge of dogs, all the dogs you've ever owned, if you've ever owned a dog, different breeds of dogs, different traits of dogs, and all of a sudden that information based off of your experience and your exposure to the world is organized in your head. Schemas can get us into trouble, however, because they are the underlying foundation for stereotypes. And stereotypes are really just shortcuts. They're shortcuts to understanding the world where we don't have to invest a lot of energy. And it's based off of often the exposure and the experiences that we have. They're not always bad. If you're looking for someone to help you, you may run to the person who's wearing a uniform and they may or may not be someone who can help, but that stereotype might be advantageous. It's important to understand that stereotypes make our decision processes easier, but we shouldn't exclusively use them. And we should be willing to seek out more information to make them more developed and maybe break down some of the stereotypes that we utilize. Concepts can also be simple or more complex. A simple concept like you had on that slide with all of the images would have been that they're all red. There's a single common feature and it ties them all together. A more complex concept can either have two or more common characteristics that must be met, or it can be disjunctive, where it can have one, two, either or, two or more, that kind of situation. Conjunctive, to be someone's aunt, you have to be one, female, and two, you have to be the sister of someone who had a child, or at least the sister-in-law of someone who had a child. So those two must be met for you to be considered anyone's aunt. If either of those are not met, then you can't be an aunt. With disjunctive, you are looking at one or both or either. And so schizophrenic uh, diagnoses, the person could hear voices, so they are having hallucinations, or they could have no hallucinations and only have delusions, distorted beliefs, or they could only have the distorted beliefs, the no hallucinations, or they could have both. So when we're talking about disjunctive, it's an either, or, or an and. Like I told you guys before, there's three levels of inclusiveness with our natural concepts. Superordinate, think Superman, high in the sky. Basic, they're right around the ground level. And then subordinate, I think of submarines, they are the least inclusive. They have the less kind of scope that they can cover. We discussed the term prototype, and that is the best example of a category. Further example of a prototype, if I were to ask you to name the first type of bird that comes to your head, that is the best example that you can think of of a bird. Most people would say something that they have familiarity with. A robin, maybe a cardinal, uh, maybe a bluebird, possibly, I don't know, a, a goose, something that you see constantly. And mostly, we're going to talk about an animal that can fly, an animal that has feathers, uh, maybe an animal that sings a song or fishes or something like that. But what we usually don't mention would be an ostrich or a penguin. While we understand that they're birds, they're flightless birds. They don't fit our best example. So if we were trying to describe a bird to somebody, we would probably go with a bird that can fly. Here you have on the left side a prototypical cat. If you were to describe a cat to somebody, that is probably the concept that pops up into your head. A sphinx, however, which is a hairless cat, probably not going to immediately have that one pop into your head. And some people may have trouble classifying it if they don't know originally that those are cats. Another aspect of cognition is problem solving. We're going to look really quickly at three basic types of problems. First one, problems of inducing structure. And these are usually like problems that have to do with analogies. This is to this as this is to this. It might be discovering relations among numbers, words, symbols. It's not just analogies, but it's that idea of you're trying to see the relationship amongst something. We can have problems of transformation. And this is where we're taking something and we're modifying it into something else, carrying out a sequence of transformations. Here you have something very basic like increasing in area, but it could be something as simple as cutting a recipe down and maybe cutting everything in half. That would be a normal problem of transformation that you might see in regular life. 
The final problem is a problem of arrangement. An arrangement is that you have to reorganize whatever it is that you're working with so it satisfies a criteria. And here you're looking at something like an anagram as an example of a problem of arrangement. How to make objects because there is a certain, or thoughts or whatever it might be, because there's a certain set criteria you have to meet, you have to rearrange it. This might be setting up, a, I don't know, a seating assignment for a wedding or, um, you know, a holiday dinner. That's a problem of arrangement. So it's not always that these problems are super specific to worksheets and classroom. It They do have a way of translating into just how we really kind of classify real world problems as well. When we look at problem solving, it is interesting to note that there is a whole host of resources out there about how to be a good problem solver. And usually the first one is always figure out what the problem is what is it really asking you? In class, we would go through a couple of riddles and I would ask you guys to really look at what the question is. And the reality is, is that most of us, we get distracted by all of the extra information. And sometimes we just forget about what the real question is. So with problem solving, you're trying to get to a goal that's blocked by an obstacle. And the first step is always clearly figuring out what it is that you are dealing with. The next step in the process is recognizing what is there and what's missing. Often we will induce constraints, we'll make up rules that don't actually exist because they have been present in previous problems or we assume that they have to be there. It's important to be flexible in your thinking and try to be insightful, but really the biggest thing that can be a problem to problem solving is going to be getting stuck in what we call a mental set. I've done it this way before, I have to do it this way again. It is habitual ways of thinking. It's always been this rule, I must go with this rule to make it work. And the reality is, is that problems usually have many, many solutions, but we get very comfortable going with whatever has worked in the past. This is something that we would do in class. I would give you nine dots and I would tell you without lifting a pen or a pencil, you have to use four lines to go through all of the dots. This is the solution, or at least a variation of the solution. What most people will do is they will start and they'll get through most of the dots, but there will be one left that they can't get. And there's a reason. They don't make one of the lines long enough to make an angle where it will still connect the other two dots. When I show people the solution, the first response usually is, I didn't know we could go outside the box. There was nothing in the instructions that said that you couldn't go outside the box, but most people will sit there and go, oh, well, wait, the box is there. The rule's always been if something is outlined, if something is contained, that's as far as we can put our work. Just remember that when we're talking about something like this, that's where the catch is. If you are problem solving, if the rule isn't there, then the rule isn't there. You might be creating the rule yourself. After you've looked at what the problem is, what is there and what isn't, the next thing to do is figure out what possible solutions you can use. And if you can find them, try them. Often at this point, people will do things like trial and error or start to narrow down what strategies are going to work best. With problem solving, there are several strategies. Trial and error is one that I'd mentioned to you guys. But two really big categories of strategies are what we call algorithms and then another group called heuristics. Now, for an algorithm, it's really important that you understand that, yes, in math class, you would have used an algorithm. It would have been a formula, and it would have given you a correct answer. In psychology, algorithms aren't always mathematical formulas, but they are rules, procedures, or steps that guarantee a correct solution. The only problem is, is that because algorithms are methodical, they might require a large amount of time and they're not nearly as quick as what we'll call a heuristic or a rule of thumb. The example that I give you guys is I give you a lock and you need to figure out the combination. If you were to use an algorithm, you would start out logically with zero, zero, zero. Then you would go to zero, zero, one, zero, zero, two, and you would continue until you tried every possible combination that could be used on that lock and you would be guaranteed to open it. But in reality, most of us would skip 000, assuming that no one would ever set a lock with three zeros. 
We might even throw out 111, 222, 333. We might employ or employ a couple of rules that are really kind of more shortcuts. A heuristic is a rule of thumb. So righty tighty, lefty loosey. We know that rule of thumb for opening and closing things. We know look left, look right, then look left again before you cross the street. And again, that works, but it's error prone. So it's a shortcut, a really quick way of making decisions. But if you are crossing a one-way street, you might really only have to look one way. The other way is probably unimportant. If you decide to travel to England, the left, right, left, well, you better go right, left, right, and make sure that the last left or direction that you look in is right. Ready, tidy, lefty, Lucy. Uh, a long time ago, I was buying my kids a toy called an aqua doodle. And it's a pen that you fill with water and you use that to draw on this very specific pad. Well, after making several attempts to open this pen with the Lefty Lucy method, I decided that it was broken. I handed it to my husband. He turned left. He couldn't get it to open. I used my teeth. I couldn't get it to open. And then I did the probably a bit more rational thing. I read the instructions. And because it was a pen that you fill with water for kids to play with, they had reversed it and they said, turn right to open. My shortcut just didn't pay off. Rules of thumbs are just quick ways of making decisions, sometimes based off of previous experience, sometimes based off of information that you have, sometimes based off of what you recognize. Problem solving can also lead to something called insight. And this is when we have this sudden realization of an answer. And insight really kind of contrasts with strategy-based solutions. It's when you just kind of come into the knowledge. It kind of just works. It gets jogged loose. We have different approaches to problem solving. We have problems that require our ability to consider pathways and use of space. An example of that might be a maze. We have trial and error where you keep trying all possible solutions and discard them until a correct one works. This one is not always an algorithm because it may not be methodical. So if you get a brand new car or you are using a rental and you decide to try to figure out the headlights without looking at maybe the actual uh, manual for the car, you may push every button, turn every dial until something works. We might also use two very basic heuristics, and actually technically three, because there will be one more that we'll talk about. These two are really important that you understand. They pop up on the AP exam. They are definitely going to be in an essay when you guys get an essay on this. This is important information. So one heuristic that we talk about is something called the representativeness heuristic, a mental representation. This is essentially a stereotype. It's a rule of thumb for judging how likely things represent or match a prototype or a best example that's in your head. And it may lead you to ignore other kind of relevant information. So you're going to pick someone up at the airport and you know that they're coming from England. You might look for somebody who in your mind would fit into the world of Harry Potter. Availability heuristic, this is estimating the likelihood that events happen based on how quickly they come to mind. So. If you are hearing about um, troubles that are happening in Chicago, you may choose not to visit Chicago because that information comes really quickly to mind and instead you decide to go somewhere else. Well, it depends on where that location is, but if it is Gary, Indiana, that's not really all that much safer than Chicago. So I always use the example of how common is murder. And when it's phrased that way, some people will say, well, if I've just watched the news, it's really common. And the reality is it's only about 2 to 3% of all violent crimes. So judging where you travel off of maybe murder rates shouldn't be the only thing that you look at, but it may be what's most available. I'll use examples in class like uh, a couple of summers ago, they started reporting about a lot of shark attacks down in the Outer Banks, which is a place that we vacation every year. Well, what people weren't doing is looking at all of the facts around it. People were chumming water near piers, they were swimming during the evening hours, and they weren't actually being killed by sharks. They were getting bit by them, yes, um, but most of those people just went to the hospital and were released afterwards. Because the news coverage was so heavy, 
the rates of people renting homes in the Outer Banks during that time period decreased significantly. They were making a decision off of what they had available to them. Hello, today my mother is going to talk about something probably boring. This is my mother. All right, well, that was Mickey. He really wanted to be in on this. I don't even know if you guys could hear him. He was very quiet. So, recognition heuristic. Sometimes we're told that the easiest decision to make is by going with what we recognize. This can happen when you go shopping and you have a name brand versus an off brand. They use the exact same ingredients, but you may feel more inclined if you don't know much about the product or you're not really sure which one to go with, to go with the one that you've seen on television or the one that you've seen advertised. We also tell you to do this when you are taking things like the multiple choice sections on an SAT. If you're not 100% certain or you feel like you're guessing, we always say go with what you recognize. So often, we'll sometimes use this heuristic when we make decisions by choosing the one that is most familiar to us. A really good way of looking at that representativeness and availability heuristic is when we talk about risky decision making. If we look at things like the stock market, well, that can be something that you are making choices under conditions of uncertainty. It may go up in value, it may drop in value, you're really kind of making a guess. And we talk about this term called subjective utility. The decision is based off of the outcome and how worthy that outcome is to the individual. But if we look at something like lottery tickets, most people won't start buying lottery tickets until the Powerball gets into like the hundreds of millions and it becomes something that's on the news and so availability heuristic you need to buy your tickets you need to get these tickets oh my gosh powerball is up too we haven't had a winner in so many you know months those sort of things become available and then you find that it drives people to buy more tickets we make this decision off of how much information is available to us and then we have things like the representativeness heuristic you may choose to play or not play based off of your own kind of stereotypes, these ideas of, well, it's no one really wins and here are the statistics or um, something along the lines of, you know, the, the grocery store near me has sold three of the last winning tickets. I should definitely choose to go to that grocery store to buy them. Either of those decisions to buy or where to buy or not to buy can be based off of that mental representation that you have for purchasing the lottery tickets and, and where a effective place to buy them may be. More approaches to solving problems, well, you can do things like form a sub goal. Sometimes problems are huge and it's much better to break it into pieces and attack one small part at a time. This is how you should attack things like projects or when you feel like a, you have an overwhelming amount of work. Don't go at the full thing, pick out a small goal and meet that first. One, it's far more motivating once you've completed that small goal, but two, you start to kind of just get ahead. This is what I do when I do things like puzzles. If I have a puzzle in front of me, the first thing I do is I create the border. That's my first goal. Then I sort into colors and then I find an image that I want to piece together and I do it incrementally. Small goals and eventually over time the full goal is met. You can also do things like change the representation of a problem. For me, when I have a hard time conceptualizing something or understanding it, I often draw a picture or a graph, make a list. It may give you insight when you can change the representation. Working backwards, this happens when you know the end result, but you're trying to find some previous unknown aspect of the problem. So something along the lines of Mickey has $5 and it is Friday afternoon. The previous Wednesday, his sister owed him $3. The Monday before that, he owed his mom $2. And the day before that, he got $1 in his allowance. How much money did Mickey start with at the beginning of the week? And you would go, okay, five minus three plus two plus one, something like that. And whatever that answer ends up being, that would be the, the little missing aspect, but you work backwards from the answer. This is a version called hill climbing. And hill climbing is a heuristic. It is a shortcut decision-making that allows you to make a choice and then essentially that choice pushes you to another choice. In other words, instead of going directly up the hill, you kind of have to zigzag your way out. So it requires moving forwards, moving back to, backwards. Something like the traffic jam game that you see here, that's a really good example of hill climbing. So the red car, the red convertible, is the one that you want to get out of the lot. And to do so, you realize that 
you can't move that car one bit unless you can move the tractor trailer, the yellow and the green car, the pink and the blue car. Well, you can't move any of those cars unless you move the white limousine that's down at the bottom. You can't move the white limousine unless you move the red truck. And so the very first step is moving the red truck up so you can move the white limousine over. Then you can ship those cars down, you can move the police car over, and each decision leads to yet another decision. But eventually, you'll be able to take the red convertible out of the lot. And the last one, search for analogies. And again, we talked about something very similar to this when we talked about the types of problems. But again, this is a heuristic. And it's not just this is to this as that is to that. It might be last Christmas um, holiday break, we went skiing and everyone had a great time. So the only way that we can have a great time again this year is to go skiing again. That might not be true, but you're searching for a solution based off of what had happened before. Or the example I have here, I have a bag of chips, but I don't have a chip clip to close them with. What can I do? Maybe I can use a paper clip. They roughly do similar things. I just have to change it a little bit. And again, when we're talking about something like this, we're trying to break out of mental sets. We're trying to find solutions to problems. People reason differently, and one of the things that we talk about is inferential reasoning. So if you make an inference, you are making a decision based off of limited information. You're taking that small amount of information and applying it to a much greater body of knowledge or problem solving. So the conclusion is reached with information that is way beyond what is known. So you may know something, but you're inferring, you're assuming greater reach. Different cultures think differently. So language shapes the way we think. That was that Benjamin Whorf hypothesis, the linguistic relativity hypothesis. And if language is at the base of culture, culture shapes the way we think. People who have been raised biculturally, though this is different than biracially, meaning that they're raised in two different cultures, they can go back and forth between two different thought processes. Cultures also influence the way that we assume categories and relationships and information. If I were to give you a snake, a bird, and a tree, Americans are going to think plants and animals, and we think in categories. Where if I were to show Chinese people a snake, a tree, and a bird, they think in relationships, and they would say that the bird and the tree go together because the bird lives in the tree, where the snake doesn't fit either of those. Again, where we grow up, our culture, all of that can influence how we think and we assume. One of the big problems that happens when we use things like heuristics is we may become overconfident. If a rule has worked in the past and yielded results, we may just assume that that rule has to work now. With overconfidence, you go with this idea that you are probably going to be correct and that tens our tendency to be confident in your correctness may overshadow any of the errors or your estimation of your correctness. So with overconfidence, we overestimate the accuracy of our beliefs and judgments. I think we've all done this, walked away from a test feeling like we knew we got an A and then we get the test back and it is not an A. It may be that we were more confident than we were correct. Framing is an important thing. Framing is the way an issue is posed. And that can significantly affect our decisions or our judgments. Today I was talking to my mom and she was talking about how she sells crafts at craft shows. and. She had told somebody that she was taking $2 off the objects that she was selling. And I was like, oh, okay. And she goes, well, essentially that's 10% off. And I'm like, 10% off sounds so much better than $2. And if you think about it, then she was talking about how to change and get more sales. And she said, well, then we decided 15% sounded better. And yes, 15% is an increase from 10%. But $2 is really the equivalent of, for most of her objects, about 15% of the value. So she hadn't really changed anything. But when the person heard that she was changing it from a $2 discount to a 15% discount, they immediately felt that that 15% was somehow better. But it was essentially equivalent. It's the same thing when you go to the grocery store and you're looking at maybe ground beef and you have the option of labeling it as 75% lean or 25% fat. They're the exact same thing. It's just that 75% lean sounds less disgusting and we're more likely to purchase it. 
The next thing that we're gonna talk about is confirmation bias. And when we're talking about confirmation bias, Peter Wasson did a really famous experiment and you have the video linked in here. Um, I will hopefully put it either in the comments or at least put this PowerPoint up on Blackboard because it has the link. But the confirmation bias is this tendency for us to want to confirm what we already think. And we've talked about this. Wasson back in 1960 did an experiment where he did, he gave people a rule. He said, I want you to tell me what the rule is, but I'm just going to give you the numbers. And he gave them two, four, and six. And the rule was that they were ascending numbers. Students decided that the rule was that they were counting by twos. So students would say eight, 10, 12. And Watson would say, that is not the answer. They're like, yes, it is. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, counting by twos, that's the answer. And Watson said, no, that's not the rule. Students stopped once they confirmed the rule that they had decided on. And they continued to prove to him that their rule worked, and it did. But that wasn't the rule he was looking for. And what he was able to show is that they were very confident in the rule, but ultimately they were wrong because he didn't tell them he was looking for the rule of counting by twos. He said, I'm giving you two, four, six. What rule am I using? Had they been a bit more creative, they could have said ascending numbers. They could have said two plus four equals six, four plus six equals 10, six plus 10 equals 16. There was an infinite number of rules that they could have constructed, but they stopped at the rule of counting by twos. Again, a wrong rule, but that's what they confirmed and then they made sure that all of their evidence pointed to that correct answer. So just be careful, just because you have an answer doesn't mean it's the correct answer. And it might not even be the answer the person was searching for and it might not be the only answer. But if you only seek out evidence that confirms that, then you may find out that other people see the limitations in your problem solving. In class, I've done this only a couple of times due to time, but I would post this picture. And obviously this is a spaghetti bridge that's held together by marshmallows. I would tell students only with the materials provided on your desk, I need you to build a bridge. And I would provide them with a box of spaghetti that is sealed and a plastic bag with maybe about 10 or 15 marshmallows. Then I would tell them that the bridge has to span eight inches and it has to support at least 10 pounds and the quickest solution would win. And who knows what they would win. It could have been like a chocolate bar or extra credit or something. And most of the students would immediately open up the box, dump out the spaghetti and start trying to construct angles or supports or something that they think would hold. And I think we all know that if you were to do that, a 10 pound stone bookend would crush spaghetti. What students failed to notice is that they had another material that they could have used, and it was the box. But what they saw was the box was for holding the spaghetti, and instead they saw two materials, spaghetti and marshmallows. And what they had was spaghetti, a box, marshmallows, and a plastic bag. All of those things could have been utilized. An inability to see a problem from a new perspective is called a fixation, where you kind of get almost like hyperlocked. You get sucked into one aspect and you can't break from it. It is a type of mental set. So fixations, a mental set is trying to solve a problem, especially with a way that had been working in the past. So when we're talking about mental sets, it sounds like other things that we've talked about. Approaches that kind of become repetitive because they worked in the way or worked in a specific way in the past a lot like some of the heuristics that we spoke of. But it is important for you to understand that it, you won't be getting similar terms together in question, so these will be kind of split. A mental set is when you cannot see the problem from any other aspect. It is really, you're just stuck in this mental trap. You cannot see it any other way. And functional fixedness is a type of mental you do not want to have functional fixedness. You do not want to be trapped in a mental set. You do not want to be fixated on a problem, unable to break free. So functional fixedness is a tendency to think of physical items only in the terms of their usual functions. And this prevents problem solving. So I'm gonna play with my son really quick. Hopefully he'll speak loud enough for you guys to hear him. But Mickey, if I were to give you a flathead screw uh, a screw that only has a single groove, not the T-shape in the top. But I told you we didn't have a screwdriver. How would you turn the screw? With my fingers? 
okay, with your fingers. Is there another way that you could turn the screw if you didn't have a screwdriver, but I needed you to tighten it down? There probably is, I just can't think of it. Can you think of any other objects you could use? Um, another screw. Okay, maybe the edge of another screw. What he's doing right now is one plane on my phone, but two, when we're looking at that, he's trying to think, he said his fingers, and I would say, yeah, you could probably stick your fingernail in there and twist the screw. That's not what your fingernails are for, but you could use it. You could run and grab a butter knife. Use the edge of a butter knife. Now he's smacking his forehead. You could, I've done this plenty of times, use a paper clip as long as it fits the groove. You could go get a pair of tweezers. He said, use another screw. I've never thought of that, but the edge of another screw might work. If what you do is you go, I have a screw, all I can use is a screwdriver, you may be fixated. Another example of this, I would always tell students, I'm like, all right, you have a student in class that has been, who's become an assassin and they need to kill another student. So you hand them a frying pan and their response to you is, but I'm not cooking them dinner. And you're like, all right. So then you hand them dental floss and they're like, well, their teeth are perfectly clean. And you start to see in that kind of more ridiculous version of an example, that they are so locked into what the original use of the object is, they don't think of any outside use. The most classic example of this, and one that we would expect you to know, is something called the candle mounting problem. And it looks like this. In the candle mounting problem, you have a box full of matches, two candles, and a whole bunch of just general standard thumbtacks, like the ones that you would push into a cork board. And the way that the problem goes is, I need you to suspend a candle so it is not on the ground, but far enough away from a wall that you can light it and it will not set the wall on fire and it will not fall to the ground. Those are your parameters. Students usually try to come up with like lots of different kind of clever tricks and try to work around what they have, but this, these are the items that you have. The tack is not long enough to pierce through the candle, go into the cork board and keep it suspended above the ground, and plus the candle would be too close to the wall and it would catch it on fire. So before, I told you guys with the bridge, most people saw that there were only two things that they could use to solve this problem. And the reality is right here, you again have four. You have a box, you have matches, you have two candles, and you have thumbtacks. And this is the solution. Take the box, use the thumbtacks, and push the box into the wall. Then use one of the matches and light it. Light the candle, drip some wax into the base of the box, Put the candle in there so it'll stand upright without any support or heck you could push a thumbtack through the bottom of the box into the candle and then light the candle or keep the candle lit if you know you didn't have to but either way it's that people will often overlook the box as something they can use now i know i didn't t bless you honey i didn't tell you guys this um in class but i do a lot of like cake baking and you know a lot of crafty stuff and so I'm always looking for ways that I can take normal items and use them. Uh, most recently I had to figure out how to make towers for a cake and I ended up using a paper towel roll as my mold. I ran around my house looking for anything that was cylindrical that I could use. I just had to think outside the box. When we talk about creative problem solving, creativity is something that you can actually develop. And it's an ability to act or think in ways that are different. But here's the big thing. It has to be valued by other people. So being creative, it doesn't mean that you just walk into a room and you're like, look, I have a bucket on my head. It's a hat. If that's not valued by anybody else, that's not really creative. So creativity has to have a value to it. People who are creative don't necessarily tend to be more intelligent. There is a weak positive correlation. But again, with creativity, you can develop this. Look at objects, look at things, and try to see them in different ways. Try to see what you can use them for. Um, it's something that I like doing. Um, with convergent and divergent thinking, these are two ways that we think, and both of them are necessary. You guys use convergent thinking when you need to come up with a single answer. There is no divergent thinking to two plus two. Two plus two equals four. That's it. But if you were to ask my son, what is one plus one equal? And he would say it equals window. 
and he would then draw you this really cool thing where he would put the one and a plus sign and a one and an equal sign and he would spread out the equal sign and that would be the top and the bottom of the window and the one and the other one would be the kind of vertical sides of the window and the plus would be the little T pane that's in the middle and that's very unconventional loosely kind of organized it breaks out of that mental set it's a different way of looking at that problem that would be divergent thinking it's the same thing as if I were to give you a bucket and say give me all of the uses you can imagine for a bucket and the amazing thing is is that children tend to not be locked into convergent thinking as much as adults they tend to be much greater divergent thinkers. They tend to feel that the rules don't always apply and that they can see things in ways that we might not. Unfortunately, we tend to chip away at that as we put them through school and we start to tell them there are rules to how you use things. There are rules to how things must be. And we start to kind of cultivate a little bit more convergent thinking. Last couple of thoughts. We have something called belief bias and perseverance. Um, when we talk about belief bias and we look at belief perseverance, one is more extreme than the other. So belief perseverance is really, really extreme. Belief bias, it's easier to understand belief bias when we see people who we think are illogical. It's sometimes harder to see um, our own thought processes as being illogical. Belief bias might be when you sit down and have a conversation with a friend and you're like, what is the best sports team that ever existed? This is a great discussion to start to see people's bias and you sit there and you tell them why your team is the best and they then say yeah but my team has won more you know trophies or they have more uh, all-star players or they have more blah 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 and you might sit there and go yeah I get that but my team and then all of a sudden you go back to your own biased belief it's hard for us to see the illogic in our conclusions it's easier for us to see the illogic that runs in other people's conclusions and often we like people who agree with us and so we don't always necessarily have all of our biases challenged but a belief bias is something that we can challenge and in some people we can change sometimes people will actually accept another person's maybe their their argument as to why their belief may be more correct Belief perseverance is different though. This is to hold on to a belief even though you're faced with counterfactual evidence, even though everything else points to the opposite. And so when we look at things like body dysmorphic disorder, which would include things like anorexia, those people have a very strong belief perseverance. Even though looking in the mirror, getting their weight taken, uh, having someone measure them with a, a measuring tape, showing them that they are a certain size. They cling to this initial conception that they are fat, and it doesn't matter what people kind of bring to them, it's almost impossible to break their belief because it perseveres, it continues on. So we would sit there and that's a really good explanation for why something like anorexia has such a high death rate. People cling to it, they continue to believe it, even when faced with otherwise evidence that would say something to the contrary. Theory of bounded rationality basically shows that while we want to think that most people make rational decisions, the reality is, is that we often make decisions considering only the available options um, and we use pretty much the, the easiest problem solving mechanisms that we can. And then that tends to lead to a rational decision. Something that you guys are already really schooled in is additive strategy and elimination by aspects when we make choices. So additive strategy. You have three colleges that you're considering and you list all of the bonuses for each one of them. Whichever one adds up to the highest score, that's the one you choose. Elimination by aspects, on the other hand, is like using a filter system on online shopping. The first thing you do is, is you put in the colleges that are in your price range and it's going to keep out all the other colleges. Then you filter by the college that has your preferred major then the one that is the size that you want and then the one that's in the area or the region that you want to go to and then you might start looking at does it have a Greek life or a football team or whatever other kind of choices that would influence it and eventually you get down to maybe one or two choices once you get down to those one or two choices you may then switch over to additive strategy and list what those kind of benefits are and whichever one has the most you go with and this is pretty much the last thing that we're really going to talk about. And this is something called the conjunction fallacy. I tell you, you're meeting someone who is articulate, they're ambitious, 
They're power hungry. They're a wheeler and dealer. They like to kind of make things happen. Are you going to meet a college professor or are you going to meet a college professor who's also a politician? Mickey, what do you think? College professor who's also a politician. And Mickey just did the conjunction fallacy. So often when we talk about this, a conjunction is when two things come together. This is an error in decision making when people look at two uncertain events and they assume that they're more likely to happen than kind of the larger event happening all by itself. So the correct answer should be that you're meeting a college professor because that's the largest overriding category. And college professors who are also politicians is a much more small kind of exclusive category. There's probably a better chance that you meet a college professor who has that kind of personality than someone who really is also in a, is a politician. But because those two things seem so specific, we are more likely to assume that the combination of these kind of two uncertain events happening together are more likely. We also, when we look at pitfalls in reasoning, uh, there is something called the gambler's fallacy, and this happens often with things like lottery tickets. Um, no one's won in a long time, that must mean I'm a winner. Well, that would be something we call a gambler's fallacy. Belief that the odds and chance of an event increase because it hasn't occurred. Or we may overestimate the improbable. We might sit there and say, well, things that are dramatic and vivid but infrequent, they receive heavy media coverage like murder, well, they must happen more often. And then the last one is this thing called specter of regret. And this is we'll often make bad decisions because we want to avoid what could potentially be bad. So a good example of this would be you have the opportunity to double your annual income, your family's annual income. You have a nine in 10 chance that if you take this bet, whatever your annual income is, will double, double for a year, nine in 10. So you have a 90% chance. You have a one in 10 chance that you would lose all of your income for an entire year. The fear of the loss, the, the loss aversion, the negative impact of losing that entire annual salary may be great enough for people to not make what would be a safe bet or a safer bet um, because they're worried about what they would regret. So uh, the last, so this is our last slide. Um, one last riddle for you guys. Um, at the end of my extra long speech, I will have you guys, uh, give you guys a chance to actually see the answer. But again, this is a really long uh, kind of unit that has a lot of terminology in it. If you have any questions, if you are unable or uncertain on how to answer a question on the worksheet, please contact me. Um, and here is the answer to your last riddle.